Caribbean can be viewed on the go now with the Airlink TV app for Google devices. Simply go to the Google Play Store, search for the Airlink TV app, download the app, click on the link and fill out the form. The account activation will be emailed or texted to the user. It's safe as no credit card is needed. The first 30 days are free and you can subscribe and receive a box for your TV to stream the same content. Good evening, assalamu alaikum, and welcome back to See Results on IBN TV. Um, we know you've been away for a couple of days this week, and we hope that you all are ready to get back up and going with us. All right, so we haven't had the program this week on Monday, so we have to do our weekly recap um, for the first time on a Thursday. So let's get to it right away. So our class um, size now on edmodo.com is up to 631 student members and we have 22 percent of the parents actively tracking their um, children's or wards uh, progress on the website all right remember we post quizzes there every week in english language arts mathematics and we also give a creative writing assignment um, and we had 108 submissions this week uh, which would have actually been last week, Friday, um, for ELA. And that was based on graphics, all right, on, a gra on certain graphics that Ms. Nyla would have shared with the class. Remember, she has been uh, pretty much comprehensively looking at all the different types of graphics that can possibly come in your SEA exam and how to interpret them and how to analyze those questions, right? And so far the students have been responding very well to these graphics 88 percent of the students have passed and the average pass mark of that exercise was 74 percent right and just to note we actually do have um, two quizzes that were posted on the weekend um, that just passed and they are in english language arts and mathematics i'll tell you a little bit more about why we didn't do a creative writing assignment in a while um, and those are still outstanding, right? And they are due tomorrow at 11.59 p.m. So please, if you haven't done your assignments as yet in, in math and ELA, please um, don't forget to do that before one minute to midnight tomorrow, all right? And then we had an assignment on mathematics, uh, which had to do with volume. Remember, we covered volume and capacity. And 60% of the students passed this exam with an average of 55%. And this um, number, you know, it's not that great. So we want you um, parents, guardians to bear this in mind when you're helping your child or um, ward prepare for the exam, that this is somewhere that they need to put some um, extra effort in. And it was basically the same um, problem that our students or a lot of students tend to have where we had, for instance, the length conversions and the mass conversions now we're converting volumes, you know, be, be it between um, cm cube to milliliters, milliliters to liters, and so on, where they have to divide and they have to multiply and move those decimal points. Um, they usually have some problems with that, all right? That's what has been taking place, all right? This time it probably was a little bit better than when we did the um, length conversions the first time, 
All right, so it shows that students have been working on it, but they need to continue to um, practice with um, those decimal point conversions. You know, it's not really um, that difficult to grasp, but sometimes when they are implementing it, they get a bit confused. Remember, you move the point to the right when we multiply, to the left when we divide, and you simply have to move it the number of zeros in that number, right? We are speaking here about the powers of 10. So you're 10, 100, 1,000, tens of thousands, etc. Well, 10,000 actually, to be specific. You move the decimal point by the number of zeros. Now, what could also lead you off track when you're doing those types of questions is not knowing the conversion between the units, all right? So you know you have to move the decimal point but you can't quite remember uh, you know, um, how much of one unit equals that of the other. So it's very important that you memorize those, right? All of those have been provided to you um, in the videos, all right? And we have you know, the videos cataloged on Facebook as well as on our YouTube channel. So if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel as yet, please remember to do so and you can use our videos um, they are very well annotated and you can look for the content that is bugging you and proceed to that video. And of course, you can always pause the videos when we are doing those questions and you'll get the answer afterwards. After you've worked it out, you hit play again and you'll get the answer, you'll get the explanation. As well as our quizzes on um, edmodo.com, when you've completed your quiz, you're going to get your results right away. As soon as you hit review quiz, right, um, you'll see your score. You'll see an individual um, item analysis there, each question where you got it wrong and the answer that was correct if you didn't get it correct, right? So please avail yourself of all of these things. Um, we have the two assignments posted at the, on the weekend for English and for mathematics. Now, for the creative writing, we've, we've started a story that's ongoing, right? We're trying to get our students to write an entire narrative writing piece. Of course, Ms. Nyla is now on the expository um, writing aspect of it. But in the past, we've been testing, you know, paragraphs and trying to get students to implement certain techniques or certain language devices and so on. Now we're trying to get it all together, right? And predictably, because of... Um, you know, it being the carnival weekend and so on, we have seen that we didn't get as many, um, as many submissions as we usually do. You know, it's normally over 100, right? So we chose to hold back on continuing the creative um, writing exercise um, for this week. But uh, at this weekend, we will um, post another assignment where they'll get to continue with that story as we, you know, project the the students to be back from whatever activities, you know, where whatever mini vacation you may have took or whatever, um, escape to the beach, time with family, whatever you may have been doing. Um, now we expect you to, to be 100% focused because this is really the home stretch now until SEA, all right? So, which is in, on April the 2nd, by the way. So don't worry, you're going to continue. Uh, with that creative writing piece, we'll, we'll give it to you on the weekend and you get to continue to write your story. So how did we do in terms of top performers in this particular uh, week that we are reporting on here? Um, we actually only had this week two students who were capable of getting 100 in both the ELA and the math. So that means it was, you know, it was a challenging week and we want to congratulate our students, Ishan and Jasmine, for being able to pull that off, right? Some weeks uh, we, ha we have more, uh, more than others. So when we have, you know, fewer people, we know that these were topics that were really quite challenging. So we do um, commend Ishan and Jasmine. And we had four people, four students who just barely missed out by a mark in either the ELA or the mathematics. Um, quizzes. So that's Zaria, Jacob, Faye, and Caitlin. And most of these guys and, and girls have been on our 100 performers list as well, right, in the past. And we hope to see them there again. And we do commend and congratulate all of you for your efforts in doing our work, right? It's really the effort that counts, and it's really continual effort that will get you 
to achieve and to excel. So now we are back here in our realm of mathematics. And you know, because we we're not having a full week this week of programming um, in order to, you know, con to do sufficient justice to our topic and to then quiz you on the weekend, what I've decided to do is to wrap up the topic that we were last doing uh, one week ago, right, which were section two statistics types questions, right? We looked at the pictograph, bar graph, frequency graph, um, chart, tally chart, the block graph, right? We looked at all of those things at the difficulty of the section two um, of the SEA paper. And there are also some statistical questions that may not fall um, you know, squarely into one of those categories. So we're gonna look at some examples of those now. And then we'll proceed to do some revision, right? On all of those topics that we've covered since the inception of the program, I have one question basically from each program, right, that we did so far. So we'll be getting a bit of revision done. It'll be a nice test to see um, if you've been revising your work and if you are on top of things. And our quiz on this weekend for maths will basically feature one question from everything that we did so far throughout the program, all right? So it's basically like a little uh, mini test for you. Well, bigger than a mini test, right? So what are these statistical questions? And remember, um, the paper, as we said, it's, it's divided into three sections. And within every section, you're gonna, you're gonna get questions on the four strands of mathematics, right? That are tested for the SEE, be it number, measurement, geometry and statistics, right? So we're in statistics, we're in section two right now. And as you can see, you're gonna get three of those questions in your section two of the paper. So we've looked at um, most of the types of questions that will come, right? We've looked at the mean, the arithmetic mean, we've looked at all the different types of charts, right? So you might get some, some other types of questions. Now we're gonna look at one or two of those. So we'll be sharing our number with you. Of course, this is the way that we like to teach here on C results. We like to give you an opportunity to help us. And then if you're going wrong, we guide you. And if you get it right, well, you've just basically helped a whole bunch of people to understand if they did not understand before, right? So again, um, those numbers are going to be made available to you. So this is a question here um, that might potentially something like this could be asked in your statistics um, questions in section two, right? So here, here's how the question goes. And of course, feel free to give us a call if you think you can assist us. So the following classes are going on a field trip and we have a cl three classes here, 5A, 5B and 5C with you know different numbers of students, 28, 19 and 27. A bus is licensed for 24 passengers. Two teachers are assigned to each bus. Will three buses accommodate all the passengers and you must explain your answer. So I have a caller on the line and I'm gonna take this call. Good afternoon caller, welcome to see results on IBN TV. Good afternoon. Hi, and who am I speaking with? Jacob. Hey, welcome Jacob. So Jacob, what are your thoughts on this question? Okay, so um, one bus equals 24 passengers, mm -hmm. and, and they, they want to carry a total of, I just need to look this out. All right, so as Jacob said, one bus is licensed for 24 passengers, and we have the number of students here that are going on this field trip. But we also have some additional information here, right? So yes. as Jacob is doing right now, trying to work it out on a sheet of paper, you likewise should be doing the same at home. And we'll see if we come up with the same thing, right? So I'm waiting on Jacob to give me his next thought now. Okay, so they need a total of 64. The, the buses need to hold a total of 64 passengers. All right, so 24 multiplied by 3. Are you sure that will give us 64? Oh, no, no. 28 plus 19 plus 27 will give you 64. Okay, 28 plus 19 plus 27 yeah. gives us 64? Yeah. 
All right. And again, I want you to check that. Eh? No pressure. Take your time. Okay, so we have 17 and 7 would give us 24, right? Yeah. And 2 is 74, right? Yeah. Okay, good. So 74, not 64. And is it just the students going on this field trip? No, teachers. Okay, and how many teachers are going on the field trip? Teachers are assigned to each bus, so two teachers are assigned to each bus, so right. um, 24 by 3 would give you 72. Mm -hmm. Therefore, three buses will not be enough to accommodate the passengers on board. All Therefore, right. you'll need four buses. All right, so you're going to need at least four buses, or maybe you need to get bigger buses, right? Yes. All right, but is, it, is 74 the final number of passengers? No. What, what, what is the final number of passengers we're looking to accommodate? Seven. So two by three would give you six. Right. And 74 plus six is 80. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jacob. You are very, very on point there with this answer. All right, so that's Jacob, people. Now, again, to recap, we have three classes, and these are the number of students in the classes, 28, 19, and 27. So we are looking here at a total of 74 students, and we, have, we want to know if three buses will accommodate all the passengers, right? If we are going to be taking three buses on this field trip, and we are told that two teachers are assigned to each bus, that means we're going to have at least six teachers, well, we're going to have six teachers there if we have three buses. Add that to the 74 students that are there already in these three classes, and we'll get a total of 80 passengers. However, a bus is licensed for 24 passengers, and if we have um, three of those buses multiplied by three, we can clearly see that those buses will only accommodate 72 passengers, right? So even without the um, presence of the, the teachers, it still would not be able to accommodate, but definitely with the inclusion of the teachers, you know we have eight passengers there that won't be um, permitted to ride on those buses, right? So therefore, um, the, three bus the three buses will not accommodate the passengers, right? And of course, the explanation um, that Jacob gave, you will have more writing space for your question than this. You will give that explanation in more detail, okay? So well done, Jacob. Now we have a, a somewhat easier question, um, but we won't take it for granted, right? This is a question that, again, might come in your section two of your mathematics paper, those statistical questions, all right? We have uh, six athletes here and they ran a race, a 100 meter race, and these are the times that those um, athletes took to complete the race and we would like to know who finished the race in last place and again you need to explain your answer. Okay, so if you think you know the answer to this question, those are the numbers there on our screen and you can give us a call. There's a really classic error that people make um, in this type of question, so hopefully you know, our caller will not. And if they do, well, they'll use that as a learning opportunity, of course. Right? So we have David who took 11.6 seconds and Harry 10.5 and so on. I have a call on the line. That's why I'll take the call now and continue reading. Good afternoon, caller. Good afternoon. And who am I speaking with? Um, Christopher Khan. Welcome, Christopher. So, Christopher, of these five, sorry, six athletes here, on our screen. Can you tell me which athlete finished the race in last place? Thomas. All right, and how come Thomas? Because he had the greatest time. All right, excellent. And incidentally, who would, fin who would have finished the race in first place? She. She, right? Yes. 
All right, excellent. So thank you so much for that call. Now, this one was pretty, uh, well, you know, it wasn't that difficult, but sometimes students look at these numbers and they think that, you know, the person with the highest number um, is the winner, right? Because in most things, in most um, activities, uh, competitions, yeah, where points are scored and so on, you're usually looking for the person with the highest points. So that's something that's just, uh, how can I say, just second nature, right? So it's an it's a error that people make all of the time. But in a race, right, we're thinking about time. Of course, the person that gets to the finish line first is the person that gets there in the least amount of time. And the person that took the longest to get to the finish line will finish the race in last place. So always remember, they try, they try to trick you with this, you know, pretty often. When we're dealing with races, you're always looking for the smallest time. And well, these um, particular numbers here, with the exception of Harry and Anil, um, who are just one-tenth of a second apart from each other, it's pretty easy to distinguish um, who is first and who is last by looking at the, um, the ones and the tens here in these digits, all right? So um, 9.97, the lowest, but we want to know the person who came in last place, which is Thomas, that took 14.3 seconds to run the race. All right, so you'll have to explain by saying that Thomas is in last place because he took the longest time to complete the race, right? So well done to our last caller. All right, so this is another type of question that, would, that could come in the statistics. And yes, it's um, related to mean. It is a mean type of question. Um, and this is basically the last question that we'll be doing. Well, we have one more, actually, mean question. in the statistics uh, questions in section two, right? So when we are done with this, we basically, and it starts that we do further um, along in the program will be from the section three. So we have here the mark scored by a student, Tiana, and we want to get some missing marks here, right? So I have a caller on the line. Good afternoon, caller. Welcome to Series Results on IBM TV. Hi. Hi, good day. And who am I speaking yeah. with? Hi. <laughs> Good day, Paula. Good day. Hi, and who am I speaking with? Um, this is Ayaz Nicholas. All right, welcome to our program. So we have this student here, Tiana, who did five exams, right? And we need to figure out what she scored in grammar and social studies. Now, the data here tells us that Tiana made the same mark in grammar and social studies and that she had a mean mark of 80 in the five subjects. So what will we do to figure out um, her mark in grammar? Okay, so it has five subjects, right? Yes. So, so you divide for, so you multiply 80 by 5. Right. Um, then you will get um, 400. You get how much? 400. Right, very good. What's next? Right. Then after you add mathematics, science, and writing. All right. And what does that give us? That will give you... Um, take your time, take your time and work it out. Um, 250. 250, so, um, excellent. 250. Right. So, therefore, what, are, what, what marks are we missing? How, how many marks are we missing here to get right. that mean? So, you minus 400 by 250. All right. And what, how much is, how much is that? You. Yeah. All right, so you're saying 
400 now, subtract 250, it gives you 150, right? Mm hmm Okay, good. But those are for two subjects. That's for grammar and social studies. So how do we know um, what Tiana got in grammar alone? Very good. And when you divide 150 by 2, what will you get? Voila. You still there with us? Yeah, hello, hello, hello. Yeah. Right. What is 150 right. divided by 2? 7.5. All right, that's actually 75, right? Mm hmm All right. So, 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 so it'll be 75 for grammar and social studies. Exactly. So she got 75 for grammar and in social, social studies. studies. And the question spe specified grammar, right? So mm -hmm. she got 75 marks in grammar. Mm -hmm. All right. Well done, Kola. Thank you so much for your help. You're welcome. All right. So let's just give this um, a quick overview again to make sure everybody's on board. Right? Remember, when we are dealing with um, the arithmetic mean, we are dealing with a particular sum divided by a particular count. Okay? We, here we have a student who attained, first of all, the same mark in grammar and social studies. So that's very important, and we'll stress why just now. Right? And she had a mean mark of 80. Okay, so how many subjects did she actually write? She wrote five subjects, math, grammar, science, social studies, and writing. And the mean of those is given as 80. So that mean is the um, sum divided by the count. We know the count, which is five, because we have five subjects. So what number divided by five would give us 80? We have to do the opposite of divide now, which is to multiply, and we got 400, right? Good. So uh, what is missing in order for us to have the sum of 400? That's what we need to know. So in order to do that, we add the marks that we do know, right, from math, science, and writing, and that gives, gave us 250 over there, right? So in order to make up the difference of the 400, we subtract the 250, and we got 150. Now, very critical um, to this question was for the examiner to let us know that Tiana made the same mark in grammar and social studies, right? Because we know that, we can just divide it by two or divide it into two equal parts. So we can say with confidence that she got 75 in grammar and 75 in social studies. Right? If they did not say that she got the same mark in, um, if she got the same mark in grammar and social studies, we'd have a whole bunch of possibilities. She could have gotten 100 in grammar and 50 in social studies, 50 in social studies, 100 in grammar, and so many combinations, like 76, 74, and so on, right? The answers, there would have been a lot of potential answers in order to get that combined um, 150, but because we know she got the same mark, that makes it possible for us to just divide it by two, right? So it would be a mistake to just, you know, share it any way that you wanted to, to put 100, for example, in one and 50 in the other, you, are, you would get it wrong, right? Because we know that she got the same mark in those subjects, we can divide it by two. So well done, Cola. And this is our final um, practice with Section 2 statistics, um, and it ties in to the topic of volume and capacity, which is the last topic in measurement we did before we moved um, on to statistics again, right? So I have a call on the line. I'll take the call and then read the question. Good afternoon, okay. caller. Welcome to see results on IBN TV. Good afternoon, Cola. All right, so re please remember, guys, when you're calling, um, that you need to mute the volume on your television and listen to us on the 
um, telephone, right? You can always replay the video on YouTube or Facebook afterwards and you'll, you'll hear yourself on the video. Don't worry about it, right? So good afternoon, caller. Welcome to See Results on IBN TV. Hi, this is Jeremiah. Hey, welcome, um, Jeremiah. So can you help us out here with this question? Let's read it together, right? We have the average capacity of four containers is one yeah. liter, 256 yeah. ml, right? We have two other containers which have a capacity of one liter, 720 yeah. ml, and two liters, 34 ml. And we want to calculate the average capacity of the six containers. So let's see how you deal with this question now. Go ahead. So you have to find the total of the first one. It says the average is 256 liters. So, I, so you have to multiply that by 4. All right. So you're multiplying what by 4? The two 256 milliliters by 4. All right, but is it 256? Remember, we have 1 liter and 256 milliliters. Also, we have to multiply 1,256 liters by 4. Right, 1,256 milliliters now, right? We've converted it all to milliliters yes. in order to get one number together. Because a liter is how, much, how many milliliters in a, in a liter? One second. Six thousand and twenty-four liters. All right, let's double check that. My mistake. Five thousand and five thousand and twenty-four liters. Right, milliliters, okay. Milliliters. Right, very good. So that is the um, total for the first four containers. Now we have two other containers with one liter, 720 milliliters, and another with two liters and 34 milliliters. How do we deal with that now? Because we want to get the average of all six. Um, the, you have to add the liter to the... You have to add the 1 liter to the 720 milliliters, which yeah. will give you 1,720 milliliters. Right. right. And then you have to add the 2 liters to the 34 milliliters, which yeah. will give you 2,034 milliliters. Excellent. So, I'm giving you an opportunity to add those. One second. Sure, go ahead. Three thousand seven hundred and fifty four. All right, well, one, one of our numbers was five thousand and twenty four, right? So you have to add all together. I'll start all of them. Yeah. Because we're including the first four as well in the six here, right? So that was the 5,024. We have to add that to the other two. Okay, hold on. Yeah, sure, no problem. Um, 8,788. You sure about the 88? Wait, 8,778. Right, 8,778 milliliters is our new total, right? Yes. And what is the count? How many, how many, um, containers do we have? How many containers do we have to find the average for now?
Jeremiah? Hello? Yeah, what, what is the next step? Um, you have six containers. Six right. Containers. So, if you want to find the average, you have to divide six by 8,778. All right, you have to divide 8,778 by six, right? So, go ahead and divide that. Okay, hold on. Um, 1,463? 1, 1,463? 1, yes. Yes, you are very correct. And if we want to express that in terms of liters and milliliters, like they did, like they did for the question, how would you state that as liters and milliliters together? You will have to move the point three spaces to the left. Okay. All right, and that would give me that would, what? And that would give you one liter and 463 milliliters. Excellent job, Jeremiah. Thank you so much for your call. You are very correct. All right, one liter. 463 milliliters. All right. So there were a lot of um, traps here, potential traps in the question. All right. First of all, is, get, is understanding that this here, this one liter, 256 ml is an average of four. Right. So therefore, some number, some sum divided by the number four gave us one liter, 256 ml. Right, the next um, thing was to convert or to bring it all into milliliters, right, to make for easier um, addition and multiplication and so on, right, to get our sum for the four containers, we multiply the average by four, right, we got that, and we added the um, capacity of the other two containers, right, so the one liter 720 ml gave us 1720 ml. And the 2 liters to the 4 ml, right? I am so happy that Jeremiah didn't make a mistake and say that that was 2340, right? We have 2 liters and 34 mls, right? So a zero is here between the 2 and the 3 because we have no hundreds, right? We add all six, the capacity of all six containers together now. And then we divided that by six, and we got 1,463 ml. And because 1,000 ml is one liter, we know that we have one liter and 463 ml as our average for the six containers altogether. All right, so that is a wrap there for our statistics and before we move on to our little revision exercise for the remainder of the program i'm going to take a break for just two minutes and i will return with those questions so you can continue to call and participate with us i'll see you in a couple of minutes
Caribbean can be viewed on the go now with the Airlink TV app for Google devices. Simply go to the Google Play Store, search for the Airlink TV app, download the app, click on the link and fill out the form. The account activation will be emailed or texted to the user. It's safe as no credit card is needed. The first 30 days are free and you can subscribe and receive a box for your TV to stream the same content. Chicly Show Limited, the Caribbean's largest manufacturers of plain and printed paper bags, leaders in plastic bags, vermicelli, spit piece powder, and grease proof paper, ideal for doubles, french fries, and sandwiches. Supplying stores nationwide. For quality products, trust Chicly Show Limited, 665 3336. I'm a cool kid, you're a cool kid, we are cool kids, are you a cool kid? Every day I want it, I need to drink what's of it, full of fruit, vitamin C. My imagination is growing and so am I. I'm getting big. So give me fruit of cool kids. It's so juicy. So I could touch the sky. Become a cool kid now by visiting www.fruitofcoolkids.com. Good evening, assalamu alaikum, and welcome back to Sea Results on IBN TV. All right, I am Sir Ijaz, and we are continuing today with our mathematics session, the only math session that we are having for this week. So with that in mind, I decided to complete the topic that we were doing last week, Thursday, and to just begin now with some revision um, questions on the, all the topics that we've covered for the duration of the program so far, and the math um, assignment for this weekend Whatever questions we don't get to complete on the show today, I have quite a few actually that I will put them there on the Edmodo for your um, revising purposes. And that will give you an, an indication of how much we've retained from our program so far. And then we'll continue next week where we left off um, just a few moments ago, getting further into our paper and our preparation for the SEA exam. And also you get to resume writing your um, creative writing piece, the, the story that we are writing about the, the fire, basically, in the grocery. So you get to continue that this weekend, and we'll be flowing as usual from next week, God willing, right? So we've done all sorts of topics so far since we began the show, and we're going to get basically a question or maybe two from each um, broad topic that we've done so far. And our first question is a question that tests your understanding of place value. So if you know the answer for this question, please give us a call and you can help me, right? So good afternoon, caller. Welcome to Sea Results on IBN TV. Hello. Hi, and who am I speaking with? Shreya, Dad. Welcome, Shreya. Thank so you. Can you help me to write the numeral? for the, the um, expanded notation here? Of course. Go ahead. So first, 500 multiplied by one, five multiplied by 100 is equal to 500. Uh-huh. And seven multiplied by one is equal to seven. Right. And six multiplied by one over 10 is equal to 0.7. Point six. Point six, I'm sorry. Right. And we have one more and on the here. Eight point one over mm -hmm. plus eight multiplied by one over a thousand, which is equivalent to what give me what? Zero zero eight point zero zero eight. Excellent. But we have to put all of this together now. And what would that yes. give us? You have to add all and you get... Five hundred and seven point six zero eight. Excellent work, Shreya. Thank you so much for your help. And this is your first time calling us, right? Yes. All right, so nice to have you on board with us. Thanks so much for your participation. Thank you so much. All right, so that's a very polite young Shreya there, and she was spot on, right? 
we have five hundreds, seven ones, six tenths, right, and eight thousandths. So remember, we have to recall the place um, value in our numerals, right, to the right and to the left of our decimal point. What does each um, place occupied mean? Right, we have our units here, our ones, our tens, our hundreds. Notice we had nothing multiplied by 10, so we have a zero here, right? Five by 100, that's where we get this five in the hundred place. Seven by one gives us seven in the ones um, place. We have six by one tenth, right? Tenths come immediately after the decimal point. Then we have hundreds. Notice we have no hundreds there, right? So a, a common error here might have been to write the eight over there. Right, but you have to pay attention to the fraction used, right? So we have the eight in the thousands position, and that is how we end up with this numeral 507.608 or 507.608. So moving on, right, we're back into the measurement realm now with time. So I have a caller on the line. Good afternoon, caller. Welcome to see results on IBN TV. Hi, good evening. Hi, and who am I speaking with? Micah George. Welcome, Micah George. Um, nice to have you. So, Micah, we have Officer Ditya here completing his duties at work at 21.35. Right? We want to get this time in standard digital notation. Can you help me with that? It will be 9.35. All right, and how do you know it's 9.35? How I do it, I just count down my finger, so I'd be like after 12, right. I'd go 13, 14, until I reach 21, and I reach 9 on my finger, so I know it's 9.55. Very good. So what you've done there is actually just to subtract 12 from 21, right? Okay. Right. Well done. So... This is 935 when in the morning or in the evening? In the morning. All right. So because we crossed the 12. Oh, it's this, evening. Right. Or, or in the night in this case, right? All right. So thank you so much for your call, Micah. Well done. Right. So when we are using the 24 hour clock, anything that's past 12, you see 13, 14, etc. That's after noon, right? Noon is 1200 um, zero, zero or 1,200 hours. And then as you continue counting upward of that, you're getting into the afternoon um, p.m., right? And of course, we know that 9.35 is in the evening or the night. Well, basically the night in our geographical location, right? So this is 9.35, right, p.m. So thank you so much, Micah, one of our um, very ever-present students on our Edmodo page. So here we have a geometry question now that deals with the concept of quarter turns, right? So we have here, Tiana is facing in a southwesterly direction. She makes a three-quarter turn in an anti-clockwise direction. Which direction will she now be facing? So if you know the answer to this question, feel free to give us a call. Right, we have here our cardinal points, north, northeast, east, southeast, south, southwest, west, and northwest. Right, so I have a caller on the line. Good afternoon, caller. Welcome to see results on IBN TV. Hi, good day. This is Iris again. Hey, welcome back to the program. Mm -hmm. So, Tiana is facing in a southwesterly direction, and she makes a three-quarter turn in an anti-clockwise direction. Where will she be facing after she turns? Go ahead and help me out there. Okay. So a three quarter so a so one quarter turn is ninety degrees. Right. So so three quarter so three quarter will be ninety multiplied uh -huh. by three. All right. But where will that take me? Right. Southeast. Southeast? Mm -hmm. All right, but how is she turning? Clockwise or anti-clockwise? Oh, shockwave, no, no, anti-clockwise. Oh, okay. Right. So it would be northwest. North I mean, no, northwest. Yeah, yeah, northwest. All right. Thank you so much for your call. You're welcome.
All right, so let me just uh, clarify here for our viewers. All right, we have a situation here where Tiana is facing a southwesterly direction. Good. And she makes a three-quarter turn in an anti-clockwise direction. Now, we know, as our caller rightly said, that a quarter turn is 90 degrees. Right, so we have here in an anti-clockwise direction. Remember, the clock clockwise is in this direction. Anti-clockwise would therefore be opposite to that, right? Anti meaning opposite. So, we have one quarter turn here, which would take us from southwest to southeast. Then we have a second quarter turn, right, which would take us to northeast. And our final quarter turn would have Tiana pointing in a northwesterly direction. So very important um, to know the number of turns. Pay attention whether it's one quarter turn, two quarter turns, three quarter turns, and so on. And very critical is to note whether you are turning in a clockwise direction or a anti-clockwise direction, because that could make all the difference in the world to your question, right? So the direction she'll be facing is northwest. So we're moving on again with our revision today. And we have four quadrilaterals here, and we want to know which one has one line of symmetry. So the lines are open. Um, again, we're just taking one or two questions from all the topics we've done so far. So this is, should be, you know, light work once you're on top of your game, all right? So those numbers are there on the screen. Good afternoon, caller. Welcome to See Results on IBN TV. Hello. Hi, good day. And who am I speaking with? Antonio George. Welcome, Antonio George. Um, can you tell me which of these quadrilaterals has just one line of symmetry? The trapezium. Which trapezium? Uh, the third, the third one. The third from the left, right? That's this one over here? Yes. Yeah. All right, very good. Well done, Antonio. That's correct. Right, Antonio, another one of our students on edmodo.com. Now, um, both of these are actually trapeziums, right? This one is a right trapezium. Okay, both of the, um, right, we have two right angles here. And then this here is a isosceles trapezium because both of these sides of the trapezium are equal in length, all right? So we can, although we don't have the figures here for all the dimensions explicitly given, you're kind of expected to look at the, look at this and to be able to discern that, right? And so we have like one line of symmetry there. Could be possibly shifted a little bit to the right. But you get the picture. Okay, <coughs> you fold it and one half is supposed to completely cover the other half. This here is just a general parallelogram, which actually has no lines of symmetry, right? We also have no lines of symmetry here for this right trapezium, okay? And this here is a rhombus, and it has two lines of symmetry. So this is 0, 0, 2, and 1. So our answer here is the isosceles trapezium. All right. So again, if you're not too familiar with this topic, if it's something that gives you a lot of trouble, there are our videos. We've done this topic before. We've looked at it in quite um, considerable length. So you can visit our YouTube channel, see results, or our Facebook page, see results as well. And you can look under the videos tab, you'll get all of our old episodes. But like we said on the YouTube channel, you'll get the, the titles and the descriptions to help you find the content that you're looking for. Okay, so we have another question now. Um, this is a statistics question. 
We have Joshua throwing darts. He scores the following points from his first five throws. After his sixth throw, the mean score was 25. What was his sixth score? So I have a caller. Good afternoon, caller. Welcome to See Results on IBN TV. Hi, good evening. Hi, good evening. And who am I speaking with? Zafira Bash. Welcome to our program. And can you help me figure out what the score was in the sixth throw? Yes. Go ahead, please. So this is, after his sixth throw, the mean score was 25. Right. So to find the total, you say 25 multiplied by 6. Yes. Which, can you hold, please? Sure. Which is 150. Okay. And yes. then you add up the numbers in the box. Mm -hmm. And then you add up the numbers in the box. And what does that give us? Um, I'm moving it out now. Sure. I'm moving it out now. Which is 135. Excellent. So we add these five throws and we get 135. So therefore, how much would the um, sixth throw be, the score? So then you say 150. Yes. Minus 135. Yeah. Which gives 15. Excellent. Which gives us 15. So the score on the sixth row was a 16, all right? Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for your help. You're welcome. All right. So, okay. So I'm going to end it there. And of course, I'll remind you of a few things before we end officially. And we are going to be joined by Miss Nyla at 6 p.m. for ELA. All right. We typically do creative writing on a Thursday. But because we had just one show this week, we decided to go with the math and the ELA because you get to continue with your story or creative writing story on this weekend okay um right so of course if you haven't joined us yet on edmodo.com feel free to download the edmodo app or to visit edmodo.com and register as a student using this code on the screen you can also as a parent register but it doesn't it isn't necessary sorry you can register on your device and actively monitor your child when they use the student account on your device that would lead to less distraction okay because we have students who get on the app and then they get distracted the time runs out on the quiz and they aren't able to um, complete it as required because it's very much like a real test once you click take the quiz timer starts you have one go at it right so please um, parents monitor your children when they are doing the test. Most of them are within 10 to 15 minutes, so it's not excessively long. All right, most of our students don't even take that amount of time to do it because we don't put too many questions. The questions are basically on the topic we've covered for that week. All right, so again, for my part, because we've had just one math class this week, I am going to be basically bringing a revision test, right? So I had a whole test prepared here. The questions that we didn't do just now on the show, they are going to come this weekend, okay? So you all can have some fun with that, some revision with that. And we'll be ready for next week as we continue to move further into our SEA math paper. So do subscribe to us on our YouTube channel. This video will be available um, by Saturday at latest. And don't go anywhere. Please stick around because in about two or three minutes, Miss Nyla will be joining us with for English language arts right here on C results. Um, it's been a pleasure working with you. Good evening. Assalamu alaikum.
Caribbean can be viewed on the go now with the Airlink TV app for Google devices. Simply go to the Google Play Store, search for the Airlink TV app, download the app, click on the link and fill out the form. The account activation will be emailed or texted to the user. It's safe as no credit card is needed. The first 30 days are free and you can subscribe and receive a box for your TV to stream the same content. Sheekly Show Limited, the Caribbean's largest manufacturers of plain and printed paper bags, leaders in plastic bags, vermicelli, spit piece powder, and greaseproof paper, ideal for doubles, french fries, and sandwiches. Supplying stores nationwide. For quality products, trust Sheekly Show Limited, 665-3336. Assalamu alaikum, good evening guys and welcome to Sea Results. If you're just joining us, you're in time for ELA. Usually on a Thursday we do um, creative writing, today we're just making an exception as we do have a lot of content yet to uh, cover in ELA. So we're just going to use this time today uh, to do ELA instead of creative writing, but don't worry, uh, next Tuesday we will be continuing with creative writing, right, um, as usual. So good evening everyone, I hope um, you students that you did go to school today, especially the standard fives. Right? We don't want to miss any um, chances that we have or last chances here to catch up on one or two things I know that we may be lacking in. Right? Um, I trust that you had a good weekend, quite enjoyable and relaxing. Um, as you know, SE is just around the corner, right? um, just a couple weeks, so you know the time is coming closer. So we still have some things to do and we are going to get started. Right? Before we do, um, I must say welcome to all our viewers, whether you are joining us on IBN TV8 channel or on our live stream on Facebook via the Sea Results page or the IBN TV page, um, TV8 page, right? So let's get started, guys. So what we were doing last day, basically, um, last two episodes, I should say rather, we were looking at different graphics, right? So graphic representation. Now, what we are trying to do, we are trying to incorporate the different graphics possible that you know that you may get. Right, and that I come across. And whatever I do come across, I'm going to bring it to you. However, today, this is the last graphic that we are focusing on. As we were seeing, this um, questions are quite similar in the graphic. Um, is that it's just as a matter that you study the graphic properly, you um, internalize the information given, and you don't underestimate the information also. Remember, each piece of information given is a clue or hint. There's a reason they are giving you it. Right, so please read... Um, every part of that graphic carefully. Now we do have one more here for you. Um, we're gonna zoom in this as much as possible, right? I did try to highlight the words in red. I'm gonna read it out to you to make it a little easier. Um, now this graphic here, I would say is one of the more difficult ones uh, that you might come across, right? So <clears throat> this is the water cycle. Now the water cycle is a part of your science and maybe your social studies lesson. Right? So at some point in time, you would have done um, the water cycle. So you have a bit of information. Now, if you don't have any previous information on the water cycle, right, um, don't be alarmed. Remember, the information is given on the graphic. What you must do is analyze the graphic carefully. So I'm going to read for you. The water cycle, to the top here, we have transportation, condensation, precipitation. Right? <clears throat> I'm going to come back to that shortly. Snow melt, runoff. To the side here, we have a mountain, right? Um, sublimation, transpiration. To the bottom, surface flow, infiltration, plant uptake. <clears throat> we have surface flow, ground flow, evaporation. Again, precipitation, condensation, and transportation. Now, as you read a graphic, you're going to notice, or oh, a few things are going to stand out to you. For example, under precipitation here, you're going to see um, what appears to be rain, right? Um, rainfall. Right. Um, if you look to the top, you'll notice the sun. Throughout, we are seeing a couple of things here with clouds. We are seeing trees. Well, surface flow tells you that some sort of water is running down from there. Right. Um, evaporation and there are arrows pointing up. Right. That tells you something. Um, ground flow. Right. Again, some sort of flow going on to the bottom here, and surface flow as well. 
Now, as you study this graphic, great, so you might be able to see it a little better there. As you study this graphic, the first glance, you may not understand thoroughly what they are trying to explain to you here. But as you go on to the questions, um, like I was telling you, um, a method of approaching the graphic is one that you read the questions and then you look at the graphic. So when you read the graphic, you have an idea, you already have an idea in the back of your head what you are looking for. Right, some of the key things to point out when you are reading, you're going to pay special attention to that. The second method was the one that we just started with. You look at the graphic, you study the graphic, and then you go to the questions, and each time revert into the graphic for information. Now, let's go to the questions here, right? What do you think is precipitation? Now, you don't have to give the scientific explanation, right? It's based on the graphic. So you look at the graphic, you look at the graphic and you try to figure out what is precipitation from this graphic. So the lines are going to be open for you. I'm going to give you a chance to call and try your best to answer these questions, right? <clears throat> so the question is asking, what do you think is precipitation? Now, you go to your graphic. You simply look for the word precipitation. It's actually two places here, right? Almost to the center and to the far right. And... Just as you have the word precipitation above that, you have a cloud. And if you look closely, right, you'll see some droplets that can be rain, right? <clears throat> or something falling from the sky. And what would fall from the sky, right? You have to use your knowledge here of your surroundings, your environment, your previous knowledge. Everything comes into play here, right, and to answer these questions. So the question is saying... What do you think is precipitation? So I'm going to give students a chance to call and let's see if they can help me answer these questions. Remember, each one of your questions in your graphic um, with two marks each, right? Sometimes they might be um, split or scaffolded into parts. So it might be one mark for, for, this, um, for A and one mark for B, right? But in your graphic, there is a total of five questions. So not that many questions, and it's a maximum of 10 marks, right, in any graphic that you get. So what you have to do, you have to be, you know, very wary of the questions, and try your best, guys. Um, it's 10 marks, 10 easy marks for you to earn, so try your best to earn that 10 marks, right? You don't want to give away an easy two marks for a question like this. When you see the word precipitation there, some of you are thinking, well, I don't know what that means, right? You don't have to know, like I said, the scientific meaning. You just have to look at the graphics, study it, and use your brain to help you figure out this question. I do have a caller, so I'm going to take this call. Good evening, and welcome to See Results. Hi, good evening. Hi, good evening. What's your name? Nicholas. Hi, Nicholas. How are you? Fine, thanks. Okay, Nicholas, did you go to school this week so far? Well, yeah, I went to school yesterday and today. Okay, that's great. So, Nicholas, this question, what do you think is precipitation? Yeah, from you the can graphic. go back to the graphic, please. Sure. And we're just going to zoom in here, um, probably right around the center here, so we have a clearer view. I'm just going to wait for the guy to zoom in there a bit, but in the meantime, you can probably um, try to figure it out. I'm not sure if he's hearing me there, right? So precipitation here, we're seeing a cloud, and we are seeing something falling from the cloud. What do you think can be falling from the cloud? Nicholas, are you there? Okay, I think we lost that call there, unfortunately, right? But I'm not going to give away the answer. Um, guys, um, can we please zoom in on this picture here? We're trying to figure out what is precipitation. Thank you. Right, so our next caller is going to be easier for our next caller. Maybe, um, Nicholas, you can call us back and try to figure out the answer. Right, so observe the graphic carefully. Right, um, look for any fine details that can assist with the question. Right, so it doesn't seem as though I have a call so I'm going to go ahead and answer that question in fact we do have a call good evening and welcome to see results hi good evening um, this is Nicholas yes Nicholas welcome back so the question is what is precipitation so we're gonna zoom gonna zoom in again once on the picture right and from this can you tell us what is precipitation yes well what I'm seeing right uh -huh. precipitation I'm seeing rain rain is falling from the clouds right right so, so um, I think participation is a, is a um, rain, rain? Yeah, that's correct. And they will award you your marks for that. 
But I have a question for you, right? Um, have you ever done the water cycle before at school or anywhere? Yeah, I've done it in standard two. Oh, in standard two. All right. So you see, so even if, thanks so much, Nicholas, for calling. Okay. All right. Okay. Right. So even if um, you didn't do it recently, you probably did at some point in time. You have some memory of it. But like I said, the graphic is there to assist. Right. So precipitation is water that falls from the clouds towards the ground. Right. In the form of rain or snow. So it can be rain or it can be snow. In the graphic here, it was rain. Right. But I'm just telling you, it can be rain or snow. Right. So just a bit of information there. So he was correct and he simple. He got that two marks although he was not perfectly aware of it. This other question here, and the lines are open, feel free to call us, guys. The diagram is called the water cycle. Why do you think it is referred to as a cycle? Now, this one here requires a bit of thinking, right? So it's telling you the name of this is a water cycle. Now, this isn't just for the graphic purpose. This is actually the name given to the specific cycle, right? This is a water cycle. So. They're asking you, why do you think it is referred to as a cycle? So what you have to do here, you have to infer the meaning of the word cycle, right? And use it with the information given or the title, which is the water cycle. And think about an answer, right? Now, this answer will have to come from you, right? Um, this is not directly given from the graphic, right? It's actually inferential. So you have to think about your answer, right? But like I said, it can be very simple. If you use the word or think about the meaning of what a cycle is. I don't um, seem to have a call there, but I'm going to go ahead and show you, right, or give you the answer for this. Now, this is just a piece of information. And actually, I do have a call, so I'm just going to not share my information right away. Good evening and welcome to see results. Hi, good evening. Cole, are you there with us? Oh. Hi, good evening. Okay, so we probably have a little trouble with the call this afternoon, but that's fine, right? So I'm going to give it one second again, see if we have another caller to help us. I know some students um, want to take a go at it, really want to try, and I do want you to try. You know, just in case you get um, a graphic such as this, Right? You know how to go about or how to approach it. Good evening and welcome to see results. Hi, good day. Hi, good evening. What's your name? Kelly Spencer. Hi, Kelly. Welcome. So, Kelly, the question was, the diagram is called a water cycle. Why do you think it is referred to as a water cycle? Oh, sorry, as a cycle. I think it's referred to as a cycle because a cycle is something that goes over and over again. Very good. And you will get your two marks for that um, answer. So hear this, um, hear this question, right? Um, have you done the water cycle recently? Uh, no. Okay, but based on the um, graphic given, will you be able to answer these questions? Yeah. Yes, you will, right? Thank you so much for calling. No problem. Right, so like, just as Kaylee said, your answer does not have to be scientific, like I said. Doesn't have to be a lot of information, just straight to the point and you will be awarded your marks. Now I'm just going to share a bit of information with you here. Right, the water cycle describes how water evaporates from the surface of the earth, rises into the atmosphere, cools and condenses into rain or snow in clouds, and falls again into the surface as precipitation. Now that is not answering the question here, I'm just sharing that piece of information with you about the water cycle so that you have a better idea about the water cycle going forward, right? If in answering the question, however, we can say it is called a cycle because it is the cycling of water in and out of the atmosphere. So hence, just as Kelly said, the cycle is doing something over and over again. The water is following a pattern, right? The water moves from one place to the next until it reaches back to the start. Then it starts cycling all over again. Right. And if you look at this graphic here, right, um, your water cycle here, right, it's going actually this way. And you would have been able to see that if there are some arrows here, um, probably if you do have this in front of you. Right. And some of you might be able to see it on the screen as well. So your water cycle, right, it moves from one place to the next until it reaches back to the start and then it starts all over again. Right. So it's just a cycle going on and on. Good. Number 41. 
In the diagram, the trees absorb some of the precipitation that falls to the ground. What would be a possible effect if there are less trees in the environment? Good. So look at this question. Try to understand what the question is asking you before you attempt to answer it. Right? It's important that you understand the vocabulary used here. So the trees absorb right, some of the precipitation that falls to the ground. We said that the precipitation, Nicholas pointed out, uh, was the rainfall. What would be a possible effect? So what will happen if there is less trees in the environment? Or if there are, sorry, there are less trees in the environment. Let's see if this caller can help us. Good evening and welcome to Series Else. Good evening. Hi, welcome. What's your name? My name is Via Duven. Nice to have you with us today. So how will you answer this question for us? Um, I would say that if there were less trees, the environment would be a lot hotter. Hotter, yeah. Any other ideas? Um, there would be less water and they absorb the water from the uh, soil and it would have more flooding. Okay, yes. I understand your point there, right? So that's perfectly correct. And we will accept that answer, right? Okay. Thanks for calling, right? So she's saying there that can lead to probably um, flooding, soil erosion, and all the effects of when we have less trees in the environment generally. So there she is using her previous knowledge, right? Um, and applying it to this question. So let's see here, right? In the diagram, the trees absorb some of the precipitation that falls to the ground. Right, so what, pos what would be a possible effect if there are less trees in the environment? If there are less trees in the environment, one effect will be that less water will be released into the atmosphere. Right, so if, they have, if there are less trees, there, um, the trees, there will be less trees to release water into the air, right, or into the atmosphere, and the balance of the water cycle will be lost. Right, so remember, you need all of those elements um, in order to have the water cycle continuing, right? Or functioning properly, right? You can't have um, less trees or no surface runoff, or you can't have, um, you will not, if there's a lack of evaporation and so on, then how will the water cycle go on? So you're seeing here how my answers, um, or the answers given here are a bit different from the student's approach. But are their answers incorrect? In fact, they are not. So this is what I'm trying to explain to you guys. Still make an attempt to answer the question. Do not leave out such a question that, you know, simple two marks, right? And we do have a caller to help us with number 42. Good evening and welcome to see results. Hello. Hi, welcome. What's your name? Chelsea. Hi, Chelsea. So do you believe that the diagram shown of the water cycle could be applied to all countries in the world? Give a reason for your answer. Um... I just gonna read it again. Sure, take your time, I understand. Um yes. Okay, so now you have to give a reason for saying yes. Because um <clears throat> What is important about the water cycle that we'll need it throughout the world? Uh, what is important about the water cycle or what does the water cycle do for us that can help the entire world? Um, it gives us oxygen. Okay, you're talking about from trees and so on, right? Yeah. All right, okay. So... We're going to take this off here and we're going to explain it a little bit, right? But you are okay. partially correct. Thank you for calling, right? Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So maybe she would have um, gotten that two marks, right? She, of course, she's going to put it in a complete sentence and complete her idea, right? So they're saying here, do you believe that the diagram shown of the water cycle could be applied to all countries in the world, right? Give a reason for your answer. Now, before I answer that question, we have to take a break. Unfortunately, um, it's Maghreb time. So don't go anywhere, guys. Um, we're going to take a break for the Maghreb Adhan, and then I'm going to join you back, and we're going to complete this session.
Assalamu alaikum, good evening guys and welcome back to C Results. If you're just joining us, welcome and we are on to ELA um, today and we are looking at graphic representation. In fact, this is the last graphic representation that we will be looking at maybe when we, uh, until we do a review paper right before SE. Um, so we are on question 42 which asks, do you believe that the diagram shown of the water cycle could be applied to all countries in the world. Give a reason for your answer, right? And we did have a student attempt to answer this question, right? So now we're just gonna share this response and a possible answer could have been, yes, I believe that it can be applied to all countries because most life, life forms need water to survive. Also, all countries experience sunlight and some form of precipitation, right? So um, the answer here can be a little open. Of course, it has to be as near to um, the question or to the meaning that they're asking for. Um, but I do believe, you know, once you answer this question, um, given the best response possible, you will be awarded your marks, right? So this is just a question uh, about what you think and it's important that you give a proper reasoning, right? So if you said no, you have to tell us why no. Um, it must be justifiable, okay? And the last question here for our graphic, so the lines are open once more. And based on the diagram, what would cause evaporation of the water from the seas and rivers to occur? So first, you must understand what the question is asking here. And then you, you can go on to answer the question. So I'm not going to share that information as yet. I'm going to wait till we have a call. And then I'm going to explain a little more about it. Right? So we had a call a second ago, so I'm going to wait again, right? So you can look at the diagram. Remember, you are looking at evaporation on the diagram. I have a, do have a call. Good evening and welcome to see results. On the diagram, I have a, do have a call. Good Hi, good evening. Hi, call. Are you there with us? Hi, good evening. and welcome to see results. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikum assalam. What's your name? Ariana. Hi, Ariana. So the question was, based on the diagram, what would cause the evaporation of water from the seas and rivers to occur? My first question to you, what do you understand by the term evaporation? Um, I don't understand what you just said. Okay, are you seeing the question right now? Yes. Okay, so I'm asking you, what do you understand by this word here, evaporation? Evaporation is like when the sun is heating the water, it rises up. Very good. So how will you answer this question? Based on the diagram, yeah. evaporation of water from seas and rivers uh -huh. occurs by... By sunlight? Yeah, that is correct and we will take that answer, right? Thanks for calling. You're welcome. Okay, so I want you to pay attention there to how that caller used the stem, right? Um, form this, the answer, the stem of an answer from the question, right? So that's important when you're answering questions. So generally when you answer a question, the information is provided for you. So you pick out the important parts, just as she said, based on the diagram, right? Evaporation of water from seas and rivers occur, and you can add on the rest of information. So that's how you form your answers. So be very mindful of that, guys. A lot of times we see in um, incomplete sentences or just part of a sentence, right? So try to avoid that. Remember, this is your English language arts exam, SEA examination. You want to get all the marks that you can possibly get. So be very careful. Right? Try not to rush. Um, if you're in a bad habit of answering questions as such, don't do it the day on SE, right? Or the day off SE. Try not to. Right? So, based on the diagram, the sun, so heat, would cause the water from the seas and rivers to evaporate, right? So, that's how evaporation would take place, right? From the sun, the heat of, or heat from the sun. So, guys, that brings us to the end of graphic representation, which is actually the last task in your section two of your ELA paper. Now we are working backwards with section two, right? So we have already completed um, section one, which entail um, spelling, 
um, punctuation and capitalization and grammar. Grammar being the longest of them all, right? So we had quite a lot to do in grammar, but thank thankfully we are over with that. And all that is left to do is revision. So now we are on to the second part of the paper and we are working backwards. So we just did our completed graphic representation and um, before graphic representation on your paper, you would have poetry. So now we are going to move on to poetry. And after we have completed poetry, uh, we are going to move on to comprehension. Now, if you know, um, there's just a couple weeks for SEA, right? So we've just about four weeks, right? We're not including this week. And so therefore, we just have a few episodes in which we can combine all that information, right? So you don't want to miss any episode. Everything... Um, that we have done so far and everything that we are going to do is pertinent to your SE exam, right? It's directly um, relevant to the SE exam. We are not doing any extra uh, work as yet, maybe when we have completed the entire syllabus, but for now we are working with the SEA paper and specifically that, right? So be, you know, be very mindful if you do miss an episode that you do have the opportunity to go back and rewatch that. And I'm gonna share a bit of information about that when we come to the end of the program. Right, so let's move on to poetry, right, or the poem as we know it. Now, there are certain things that we must know, right, um, before we start poetry, the poetry aspect. For example, there are some tips I'm going to share for you or share with you on how to interpret a poem. Now, when I say interpret, how to understand what a poem is telling you. Sometimes a poem is written in such a way um, that you don't understand clearly what they are saying, or it's easy to confuse the student, right? So that's why I'm going to share some tips, you know, on understanding the poem itself, right? So whether it's um, how it's written or the use of figurative language or any of those things, you are still going to be able to um, analyze and interpret the information given in your poem. So let's look here. First thing, read the title as a clue to the meaning. So whatever is the title of the poem, take that as a clue, right, um, to the meaning of the poem. Um, and I'm going to show you what I mean by that when we do start a poem shortly. Read the whole poem to get the general idea and mood, right? So when you have your poem, uh, I don't want you guys to read um, stanza one and go to the questions and answer those questions. Don't do that. What I want you to do, what is important, read the entire poem, understand it, make little notes about it, and then move on to your questions. Now, it's the same as for graphic. When I say same, I mean the method. You can read the poem, and then read the questions, and then read the poem again. Or you can read the questions twice, and then read the poem, right? Um, it's up to you whichever method you prefer, right? Once you get the answers and the idea across. Um, notice for the second part of this point, I said to get the general idea and mood. Now, mood is something I will be coming to shortly, right? We ha always have questions with mood and tone. So you must also understand what those terms mean. And I'm going to help you understand what they mean a little bit from now, right? Also, ask yourself what this is about, what the poem is saying, what does the po poem say, what is the theme, right? So when you're reading your poem, make sure to ask yourself, do I understand what I have just read? Do I need to reread this poem? What is the stanza telling me as opposed to stanza two or stanza three? Why is stanza four different from stanza one? What is the mood in stanza one or what is the mood in stanza two? Right, so all of those things you must know, all right, at the top of your head before you even start to answer those questions. Because if you, if you don't understand what the poem is saying and you move on to your questions, will you be able to answer your questions properly I don't think so, right? So, uh, moving on, we read the poem using the punctuation as a guide. Poems are written in stanzas or verses. So, let's take the first part of this point here, right? So, we read the poem using the punctuation as a guide. So, if um, sometimes in a poem, how it's written, you don't have an entire sentence on one line. Uh, so, what you can do, they are written line by line sometimes. So, what you can do, look for the entire sentence and read that as a sentence. Right, and then go on to understanding the next sentence. So sentence by sentence helps you to understand rather than line by line. Now that is not um, set in stone. You don't always have to do that. 
But if you are having some difficulty understanding the poem, that's a way or um, that a strategy that you can use to help you understand what the poem is saying. Using punctuation as a guide. So read until where there's a comma or read until there's a complete sentence. Right? And here we have poems are written in stanzas or verses. Right? So stanzas comprise of a couple lines, verses, um, verses or stanzas, right? And it's usually numbered, right? So uh, your stanzas will be numbered probably... I'll show you an example when we get into the poem. When I say numbered, at the side, sometimes on the right side of it, uh, there are numbers of so 5, 10, 15, 20, right? So if we're asking you a question about line 7, it's easy to pinpoint where is line 5, so you can easily identify line 7, right? So you don't have to sit there and count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, right? That's the purpose of the numbering of your um, poem. Next point. Stop where there is a period or other end marks, not at the end of the line. So this is going with the same point of punctuation, right? So they're telling you here to stop where there's a full stop, right? So stop reading to understand that sentence where there's a full stop or other end marks, exclamation, question, and so on, right? Not the end of the line because at the end of the line may not be your complete idea. Next point, notice any repetition of lines or if it, if a rhythm was de developed, sorry. I'm gonna read that again. Notice any repetition of lines or if a rhythm was developed, which lines show emphasis? So let's go with the first part of the point here, right? Repetition, we're looking for words that repeat itself or a line that repeats itself. Now think to yourself, why would a line or a word, right, um, repeat itself? What are they trying to create there, right? What is the emphasis, what is the importance? Right? What are they trying to tell you? There must be a reason that they are repeating or creating some sort of repetition. More than likely, if there's repetition in the poem, they're going to ask you a question based on the repetition. So be very um, mindful of when you're reading a poem and there's repetition. Pay close attention to it. Right? More than likely, a question is going to come about that. So ensure that you understand why they are repeating what they are repeating. Next point. Examine the language used and the uh, phrasing of ideas. Have any comparison been made? So they're saying here, um, basically they are looking for the language use, right? And the phrasing of ideas. So they're asking you, why are they doing that, right? How do the images or the imagery, right? So your sensory details here, enable you to make meanings. What figures of speech have been used? So this entire point here is focusing on your figurative language and your sensory details. Now, if there's figurative language, or more than likely there will be in a poem, they're going to ask you to identify, to be able to identify your figurative language. Now, in um, ELA, we actually did a bit of figurative language. Um, and we did not complete all, as a matter of fact. We just did a couple. So today we will also be completing the rest of that. What is really important, guys, is knowing your figurative language. Know those literary devices inside out. Because if they ask you to identify personification in a poem, and you are confusing personification with a metaphor, right, will you be able to answer that question correctly? Right? And um, in a poem, that's one of the key things, figurative language or sensory details. They all seldom um, ask you, and they often ask you to... Um, Identify your figures of speech, right? So be careful with that. Read the poem aloud. Now, this point here is if you are alone, obviously. Now, you can't read the poem aloud in SEA, right? You're going to disturb other students and you're not allowed to speak, right? Even if it's for SEA. So what you can do, use this point as a practice home, right? Sometimes when I read aloud, I understand what I'm reading a little better. Sometimes I feel like I need to hear what I am saying. Right? I don't know how many of you feel that way. Right? It doesn't apply to all of us. Seek out a pattern, do words rhyme. So this is similar to the point um, where we are looking for a pattern or a rhythm in our words or our phrases and so on. Summarize in your own words what the poem is about and try to understand the poem's tone and theme. Now, after you have read the entire poem, it's important that you now sum up what you read. Say to yourself, well, I understand this by re from, from reading the poem, right? And the tone here, another key term that we are going to discuss. So, so far we have to discuss mood 
And now we also have to discuss tone. What is the difference? And how many of you already know the difference? If you get a question with tone or if you get a question with mood. And the theme, right? So what your poem is all about. And generally, poems work with themes. Right? So here now, we're just going to recap a little bit of some of the figurative um, devices that we did go through already. So I just put it in a table form for you because remember it's not a concept lesson. We are just revisiting some of the things that we already touched on. Now I thought it was important that or essential that we do this because we can't go into poetry without discussing figures of speech. It's really, really, really important. I can't stress that enough how important your literary devices are. Right? So let's just recap a little bit. You have your figure of speech, you have a description, so what it is, and an example to help you understand further. So we have a simile here. Now what is a simile? A simile is a comparison using as or like, right? For example, as sweet as honey, bright like the sun, right? So you can use as or you can use like. It's a comparison um, of two, two unlike things, right? So, and then we have a metaphor. A metaphor is also a comparison, guys, without using as or like this time, right? So just as we had as or we had like here, now in a metaphor, we don't have those to help us. So I easily identify, well, this is a simile because I'm seeing like, or this is a, a simile because I'm using as here to compare things. A metaphor is a comparison without using as or like. For instance, she is an angel, right? The class was a zoo. Both of these are examples of metaphors, right? So these are um, comparison between two unlike things, right? So I hope you understand that. If you do not understand that clearly, if it's the first time you are coming across this with us, right, and you'd like to learn a little bit more, please um, revisit or visit our videos on YouTube. I'm telling you YouTube because they are easily um, identifiable there because they are listed by name. So for example, the video on literary devices will be titled Literary Devices. So you just go and you look for that episode and you will pinpoint that really quickly. All right, so that's two, for, two so far, simile and metaphor. Next, we have personification and onomatopoeia, right? So personification is um, given human qualities to inanimate or non-living things, right? So you're gonna give a human quality to something that is not living. For example, the trees dance and sway too, right? Um, now that's, that sentence is incomplete, but the idea is the trees dance and sway. Now in reality, can trees dance or can trees sway, right? Um, those are actually human qualities. So we're given something there, right? Um, a human quality. The stars winked at me. Here your stars, non-living, right? I'm um, given a human quality, which is to wink. Stars cannot actually wink, right? Next, we have onomatopoeia. And you will realize, guys, I'm going, um, going through these figures of speech a little um, quickly because, like I said, we did complete these already, right? And we do have a lot of work um, to go through. So onomatopoeia, use of words that, uh, that imitate the sounds associated with the objects or actions that they refer to, right? So these words imitate the sound. So once you see that word, you can uh, picture hearing that sound. For example, honk, it's a sound word, right? Drip, or boom, hoot, zoom, pop, splash, crunch, right? All of those are sound words. When you say them, you, know, you can hear its sound. So onomatopoeia is all about sound words. So, so far we listed simile, metaphor, personification, onomatopoeia. Now, we also covered hyperbole, right? Hyperbole is an exaggeration, right? So some of you like to exaggerate a lot. So you might use hyperbole in your speech. For example, I'm so tired I could sleep for a year, right? Or the food was so hot my ears were smoking. My ears were smoking. You have a million toys in your room, right? Do you actually have a million toys? Can you have a million toys in your room, right? Um, can your ears really smoke, right? Can you actually sleep for a year? So you see guys, this is an exaggeration, right? So those were the five figures of speech that we did complete so far. Now what we still have to complete is alliteration and oxymoron, 
right? So here, we're going to talk a little bit about alliteration. Now, alliteration, uh, you have been coming across alliteration probably since standard one, right? So you are familiar with it. So alliteration happens when words that start with the same sound, not just the same letter. So sometimes we often confuse that when they start with the same letter. Notice they also start with the same sound. Are used repeatedly in a phrase or sentence. The sound is usually a consonant and the words don't have to be right next to one another. So they don't have to be uh, one after the other, right? So they can have two and they can skip and then they can have another one. So two things here. Alliter alliteration happens when words um, start with the same sound or the same letter, right? So look at this. For example, Sally is super slushy, right? Or crazy cats kept coming constantly. Here is where you have um, a word in the middle here between your sounds or your similar letters. Perfect pieces of pizza for party people to pass around, right? My friend fries French fries. Or a very popular one, Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers, right? So these are also what we call tongue twisters. When you say them really quickly, like if you say this last one here really quickly, uh, five times, will you be able to do it properly? You can probably try that so when you get some spare time, right? So alliteration, you may have the same letters consecutively or the same sound. Now, the last literary device that we are going to be looking at is actually oxymoron. Now, what is oxymoron? Right? An oxymoron is a phrase made of two more words that are actually um, or that actually have opposite meanings. So these two words or these phrases here actually have opposite meanings. You might say that they <coughs> juxtapose each other, which means when placed close together, they create an interesting contrasting e effect. Right? So this last part here is a bit important. Right? So what you have to remember about an oxymoron is that it's a phrase made of two or more words that actually have opposite meanings. And when they are placed close to each other, right, they create an interesting, contrasting effect. So let's look at some examples here. Right? And these are what you are accustomed to. Right? Maybe the term oxymoron uh, might cause some confusion in your brain. You may not remember it offhand, right? But <clears throat> when you see these um, words together, you will understand. So a big baby, right? We usually think of a baby as uh, somebody who is small. It's, well, actually it is, right? A small human, right? So you might call somebody a big baby or innocent criminal or deafening silence or pretty ugly, bittersweet, original copy, Living dead, awfully nice, only choice, freezer burn, right? So these here, as you can see, all these words, when you put them together, they are or they have a contrasting effect, right? So if I say awfully nice, the word awfully here suggests something awful, right? Or something bad. But if I say nice, right? So that's something pleasant. So I put those together and you see the effect they create. Or if I say only choice, only here suggests one. But the word choice here, right? You have more than one option, right? So here, only choice, again, a contrasting e effect. And look at this last one, freezer burn. So a freezer here is something that's usually cold and a burn, right, associated with heat, right? So you have hot and you have cold combined to give you an effect, right? So, um, Oxymoron is not as popular in the poems, but it's still good to be aware just in case, right? Um, but the others that we did cover, they are quite frequent. So ensure that you learn all of them, become familiar with them. So just in case, you know, you, um, they ask, ask you to pinpoint alliteration or personification or metaphor, you know how to differentiate between all of those, right? And I just have a little activity here. Right, um, what we're going to do, we're going to open the phone lines. Now, what you have to do, right, so for example, I have to the top alliteration. So I have your literary devices and I have examples. So you have to give me which um, letter uh, tells us it is alliteration. So for example, if, it's, if it is D, you'll tell me D for alliteration, right? Um, 
So we have all the literary devices here that we just covered, and I have examples for all of those. So you have to read through the examples, find the example associated with personification or nomatopoeia or any one of those, right, and give me the correct answer. So I'm just going to hold on a few seconds until we have a call or two to help us complete this task, right? <clears throat> so this here is going to bring us to the end of our literary devices aspect of poetry. Remember in poetry, there are a few things that we are covering. And the next, on, next topic is going to be tone and mood. And we do have a caller here to help us. Good evening and welcome to see results. Hi, good evening. Hi, welcome. This is Nicholas from Hi, Nicholas. B, right? Um, it's personification. Which one? Um, B, personification, the cup dance around the table. Okay, so, all right, so you do it in that form, no problem. So B here, personification, right? Yeah. Okay, so this one is completed. So thank you so much for calling. Okay. All right, so he just shows a random one, which is fine, right? We have another caller there. Good evening, and welcome to see results. Hi, good evening. Hello. Hi, good evening. Welcome. Hi. What's your name? Ian. Nice to have you with us, Ian. So which one are you going to do for us? The um, simile. Simile, all right. Which one is that? P, um, F. P is as strong as an up. Okay, very good. Thanks for calling. Right, so, so far, so good. We do have another caller to help us. Good evening and welcome to Series Results. Hello, good day. Hi, good evening. What's your name? This, this is Nehemiah Finley. Nice to have you with us. Which one are you going to give the answer for? G is onomatopoeia. Right, and what is, the sound in, what is the sound in word there? Clanging. Clanging, very good. Thanks for calling. Yes. We have another caller. Good evening and welcome to Series Results. Hello, good evening. Hi, welcome. What's your name? Kelly Spencer. Hi, Kelly. Which one are you going to do for us? Um, alliteration. Okay, and what is the alliteration example here? Um, example C. C, you are correct. Thank you, Kelly. Right, um, any other callers? So we want to roll this. I'm going to give. Okay, we do have a caller. Good evening and welcome to see results. Hello. Hi, good evening. Welcome. Hello. Hi, what's your name? My name is Mahadi. Nice to have you with us. So which one are you going to do for us? I'm going to do I'm going to do metaphor. Yeah, which one is metaphor? A. A. His you heart are, was a block of ice. You are correct. Thanks for calling. Right, so we have two left. Uh, good evening and welcome to see results. Hi. Hi, welcome. What's your name? Lionel. Hi Lionel. So which one are you going to do for us? Oxymoron and hyperbole. Okay, so tell me, which one is oxymoron here? Oxymoron is um, D. Yes, so, and the last one, hyperbole, will be? E. E, you are correct. Thank you, Lionel. Okay, so we're not going to be taking any more calls for this exercise. I just want to go through it a little bit, right? So each and every one of our caller was correct here, right? So let's just go through here. So let's start with alliteration, right? C. Mom made pink and purple popsicles, right? So you're seeing there, right? We have the same letters and um, pink and purple popsicles, right? So it's sort of a tongue twister again, if you say it quickly. Um, onomatopoeia, G. The clanging pots and pans woke the baby. The sound word here, onomatopoeia in the sentence, is actually clanging. F. Simile. He is as strong as an ox. Easy to identify because we have as strong as here, which shows us it's a comparison, right? We're comparing the, pers comparing the person to an animal, the strength of an animal, right? Next, we have personification, which was B. The cup danced across the table. Can a cup actually dance? No, it cannot. This is a human quality given to a non-living thing, right? So it's personification. Metaphor, which was A. His heart was a block of ice. So we're comparing his heart or his feelings, right, to a block of ice. And how does a block of ice feel? Cold. Oxymoron, which was D. We use plastic glasses at the party. So again here, look at the contrast. Plastic 
glasses to different materials, right? And lastly, hyperbole E. This bag weighs a ton, right? So he's probably talking about a school bag or giving that example. So great job there, guys. Um, next day when you join us for ELA, we are going to continue with um, the poetry aspect of the section two paper. Now, before we go, I want to remind you guys that um, this week there are quizzes up for you. There are quizzes up on our Edmodo class. Um, however, we only have ELA, uh, which we have a graphic again, and we have mathematics. The creative writing, we are actually continuing with our narrative piece, although we are currently um, discussing report writing. The assignment that was given a couple of weeks ago was actually based on a narrative piece, right? So we are collecting all those pieces. Please submit your pieces on time, right? I know some of you have some difficulty with that. Um, and we did accept one or two late pieces, but we are not encouraging it, okay? It's a little um, tedious when we have to do that extra correction of the first paragraph, the second paragraph, and now the third paragraph, right? So be mindful of that. Um, parents and new students, if you're interested in joining our Edmodo class, and I do encourage you to, right? It's a great avenue um, for students to come aboard and discuss um, any problems that may have in the classroom. When I say problems, I mean mathematical problems or ELA problems, right? So feel free to post your questions. Um, the other students are there to help you on this forum. And of course, so Ijaz and I do occasionally um, browse through the class and we do assist where we can. Um, the class code is here, right? You simply enter this class code for both students and for parents if you're interested in registering with us. The class code is also up on your screen, very easy for you to see. You follow the three quick steps and you are part of the Edmodo class, right? Um, also, I want to remind you guys that you can rewatch this video every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, respectively. So that's the Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday show. Um, so every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, right here on IBN Channel 8, right? If you missed it. Now, why we encourage you to rewatch the video, guys? Um, Sometimes when you look at us for the first time, you feel like you understand, but then you come across a problem in the classroom or you're trying to remember something and it's not that clear to you. So when you go back and you rewatch the video a second time, it becomes clearer, right? It helps you to understand a bit better what you were taught, especially if it's the first time that you were probably learning something just as we did, right? So we do encourage you to rewatch the videos right here on channel eight, or of course you can rewatch it on our series results page on Facebook. And like I said, it's labeled nicely for you on YouTube as well. So the options are there for you. Take full advantage. Invite your friends, um, your parents, or whoever you wish to come and, you know, join us, watch the show, and learn, take away all the information that they can. Remember, we are getting ready for SEA. We have a lot of work to do. So I do expect to see you guys on Monday for mathematics and ELA once more. I do hope that you have a great weekend. And we look forward to seeing you on Monday. It has been my pleasure working with you this evening, guys. And I will see you on Monday as well as Sejaz. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening.